So, the last lecture of this uh, year, 2008, is about the motion of plates. We have seen in the introduction uh, to geodynamics uh, how turbulent and how fluid the inner inter part, the in internal part of the Earth is. But at the same time, we have seen that at the surface of the Earth, we have relatively rigid plates which move around. And uh, the motion of the plates is the topic of today's lecture. These plates, if you consider them on a sphere or on the planet, are in fact very, very thin. So in this picture that we have seen um, in the last uh, lecture, really the lithosphere starting from the middle of the Earth is almost invisible. It's very, very thin. But it is much stronger than the asthenosphere below it, so that it can really behave as a plate, as a coherent plate. And this is just to remind you, a movie which will come in the next lecture, that the internal part of the mantle on geological time scales is really like a fluid. It is convecting, it is moving around. But today we are concerned with the plates on the surface or very close to the surface of the Earth which are moving around. Again, just to repeat, we are considered, mm -hmm. considering lithospheric plates and the bottom of the lithosphere is where the mantle is warm enough to become very soft. So the boundary between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere is an isotherm. Most people consider this boundary to be the 1,300 centigrade isotherm. At 1,300 degrees, at those pressures, the mantle is so hot that it is partially molten. It contains just a few percent of melt. It is not a liquid, it is a solid. But it is, on geologic time scales, much, much softer than the lithosphere. And this is why there is this decoupling between the plates and everything which is below them. And of course you have heard in the introductory lectures that a new material is created at the spreading centers where the two plates move apart and that plates are transported into the earth in the subduction zones. And today we will look at plate motion. The first series of pictures uh, you can find on the internet uh, there are quite a lot of plate motion atlases and it is important to remember that uh, there is not one solution for the motion of the plates over the whole history of the earth there are several models and this is one of them uh, using the plates 2002 uh, database from the University of Texas and uh, I've uh, taken a few pictures uh, from this uh, database where um, on this global map all the plates which used to be separate at one time during the, the geological history are marked in different colors. And here on the bottom left you uh, see the age or the time at which this plate configuration is uh, plotted. So this is the early Devonian and the reason why I started it is because we have early Devonian rocks quite close to here uh, in the Eiffel and the Ardennes. So at that time, of course, the plate configuration was very different and what we uh, call Europe now was very close to the uh, equator. And then typical movies uh, show that you form supercontinents at different times, the plates move around now this is the late Devonian and we or our uh, Europe is in this part of the world and in the uh, later Devonian and early Carboniferous uh, you have a collision belt here that is where the Variscan uh, origin takes place and uh, the mountains uh, which we study when we go into the field on weekend field trips are formed.
So this was this origin here. And then most people agree that on the east side of this origin you get a very large ocean, the Tethys Ocean at that time. And then if you go a little bit further in time, in the middle Jurassic, the Atlantic starts opening, so now you recognize that this is Africa, this is South America, this is North America, which were formed by the amalgamation of plates in earlier geologic history. And now um, North Africa and North America start to split, the Atlantic starts to open, and this is where the Alpine origin in Europe starts, the extension in this origin. And now from this time, you see these stripes appearing on the map. These are the stripes which mark the ages of ocean floor, oceanic crust, which is still preserved today. So in the early Cretaceous, uh, the Tethys Ocean is still here, and this is where the Alpine Orogeny is being formed at that time. Uh, India has started to move away from the uh, eastern part of Africa. And now, in the early Cretaceous, in, at 100 million years ago, the southern part of the Atlantic starts to open, and Africa makes an anticlockwise motion with respect to Europe. And this anticlockwise motion brings us the closure of the ocean between Europe and Africa and the formation of the Alpine mountain chain. At the same time, also, please watch India, which is moving very, very rapidly across the Indian Ocean. 40 million years ago, the Alps are big mountains. Um, India is already almost completely colliding with Asia. This is the situation 10 million years ago. The Arabian plate started to move away from Africa and you get the Red Sea. And today, this is the position of the continents. Uh, the red lines are the plate boundaries as we know them. So you probably have seen reconstructions like this. You have uh, wondered about the motion of the plates and you have a basic idea of how this configuration has evolved over time. In this lecture, we will now go into a lot more detail about how the plates actually move, and you will discover that there are a lot of very interesting and intricate uh, aspects of plate motion that maybe you haven't thought about before. But first of all, how do we know about plate motions? Well, since about 15 years, we have been able to put GPS receivers on different continents and we know that they actually move around with velocity that we can measure. This is the velocity which was measured over the past 15 years. But how do we know plate motion over the past, say, 100 million years? Much, much longer time scales. Well, the first, say, 150, 180 million years, we can do a lot using data on the age of the seafloor. So this map, a very famous one, uh, you can find it on many uh, different textbooks, you can find it on internet sites, gives you the age of the oceanic crust. These are the continental crust, much, much older than the oceanic crust, and the oldest preserved oceanic crust at the moment that we can find is about 160 million years old. And very little of that is in fact there. Most of it is quite a bit younger. And what you can do now, if you want to reconstruct the motion of the plates, is simply take away, say, the youngest 10 million years, which is here the very dark part, and move the plates back so that you close the gap. Of course, in the subduction stones, you will have to pull out the plate which has been subducted. And so this way, you can reconstruct the plate motion quite easily. 
There is uh, another method <coughs> based on hotspots, which I will explain now. And using all this data, uh, there are global models of how and with which velocity the plates are moving. So this diagram here, a very famous one, uh, it has also been known for uh, quite a long time, since the beginning of the plate tectonics revolution. Um, these are the plate velocities in a hot spot reference frame. So every plate, I think you know the names, some of them are a little bit uh, more, a little bit less known. The Nazca plate, here is the South American plate. And please note that the eastern boundary of the South American plate is not where the coast is. It is in the middle of the ocean. So this is the plate boundary. So the South American plate is moving to the west. The Nazca plate is moving to the east. And in the boundary between the two is the subduction zone called the Andes. Okay. So this is the velocity of plates in a hotspot reference frame. What are hotspots? Hotspots we will come to in the next lecture. These are places where from very deep in the mantle, hot mantle material comes up through the mantle and where it reaches the surface, it melts, at least partially, forms magma, which is marked by volcanoes. And these hotspots are thought to be very, very stable on the planet much more stable than the motion of the plates themselves. So, if you look at these hotspots, there are quite a lot. Here is the Hawaii one, here is the McDonald, here is the Easter uh, Islands hotspot, the Yellowstone, Azores, Iceland, Afar, Reunion, Tristan de Cunha uh, hotspot. All of these hotspots are marked by trails or little chains of volcanoes. The most famous one is of course that of Hawaii. So if you go to the island of Hawaii, you will find a volcano. But then along this line here, the Emperor Hawaiian chain, you will find a whole series of little volcanoes which get older going away from the island of Hawaii itself. And of course, the model, you have uh, heard about this in the uh, introduction in geoscience lectures, is that there is a hot spot, mantle material coming up through the mantle, forming the volcanoes, and the plates are moving over this hot spot. And every time the plate has moved, or the volcano has moved away from where the magma is generated, it comes through and forms a new volcano the plate moves, you form a new volcano. So if you do this, you can determine, assuming that the hot spots are stable, they don't move around, um, you can determine the velocities of the plates. Um, but how do we know that hot spots are so stable? There are many arguments, which I won't be able to go into in detail now. But one of the most classic arguments is uh, found by hotspot trails in the Pacific. So here is the Hawaii, here is the Easter Island, and here is the McDonald uh, hotspots chain. And if you draw a line across them, then you see that they are parallel and they also change direction at more or less the same time. Now, if you take as the first approximation that the Pacific plate is rigid and it moves over these hotspots and the, the trails of the hotspots are parallel and also they change direction at the same time, it really must mean that these three hotspots are stable with respect to each other at least. And you can take this argument and argue that